Welcome to episode 26 of Success with Demo. Each episode analyzes the theoretical and practical aspects of our monthly release cards. Today we'll be looking at economic warfare. Now there are a few things we immediately notice about this card. The first is that this is probably the first card to reference a food type. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this really is the first time we are seeing food reference on a Netrunner card. Secondly, um, this card, even though it looks simple and straightforward by design, actually, it's pretty complex. We can actually talk a lot about mechanics and the way it shapes the game and how good it is and so on. I could actually ramble on for a day uh, regarding this, so uh, do bear with me as I go through uh, my thoughts on this card uh, and my theory crafting on it. So economic warfare, as you can probably infer by the image, is basically a reverse sure gamble. Instead of the runner gaining 4 credits, they lose 4 credits. Well, as we all know, Sure Gamble is a pretty ubiquitous card out there. In fact, just like its corp counterpart Hedge Fund, it's seen in many decks. And with good reason. Uh, first and foremost, the baseline um, gain of 4 credits for a click is pretty solid. Uh, and also, it really helps that there is very little that your opponent can do to stop you from gaining these 4 credits. It's very unconditional economy. So it's a very, it's a staple card, it's very reliable, but what really pushes it over the top and what makes it uh, so good and so prevalent is that um, it enables turn 1 economy like no other. It was all, it it was practically designed this way, even though I'm not the designer of this game, it seems very obvious. You start the game with 5 credits and there's this card conveniently priced at that uh, credit level that allows you to gain so many credits in one click. Uh, what this means is, if you think of the standard corp opening turn of install eyes on HQ, install eyes on R&D, and click for a credit, compare clicking for credit with playing a show gamble. If you click for a credit, you'll be on 6 credits. You can threaten some, you know, low range ice, maybe mid range ice, but you'll go broke that way. Things like Ike and IP block. But if you are able to substitute the gain of gain one credit with a hedge fund that was in your opening hand, suddenly you open up a lot more threats. You can threaten the higher range ice like DNA tracker or even a very nasty um operation like hard hitting news that sets the runner back big time. And you could say the same for the runner side. Uh, opening hand with Sure Gamble is one which you are able to threaten remotes early because you can threaten the credit level to install your icebreaker and break their remote ice. You can't say the same for a hand without the Sure Gamble. Hence, uh, Hedge Fund and Sure Gamble, uh, their ability to just burst you through the early game, allow you to charge right off the gate like a horse, is what makes it so prevalent right now and is basically an auto include in every single deck. Okay, fine. Most decks. <coughs> Stupid memes. Well, memes aside, um, uh, Hedge Fund and Show Gamble are basically auto include, so this might lead you to think that Economic Warfare is a similar auto include. After all, it does the same thing, right? It forces 4 credits away from the runner, which means that it would hinder their early setup that much more. Even denying their Show Gamble if they have it in their opening hand. Well, no, it doesn't do that. Obviously, economic warfare cannot be played due to its restriction. It has to be played only after the runner makes a run on the last turn, which means that you can't play it on turn 1, the turn where it will give you the most benefit. Imagine if your opponent could only start with a single credit. They would be so far behind the game. Well, that's too broken, so this is why it has this restriction, and because of that, it's a lot less good. Not to mention that unlike Hatch Run and Sure Gamble, this one's actually in the Wayland faction. So if you're not Wayland, you're gonna fork out 2 influence for this per pop. Not something very tantalizing, I would say. So because of that, uh, uh, Economic Warfare is definitely not the auto-include card that it is, uh, unlike Sure Gamble or Hedge Fund. You won't see it in every single Wayland deck. However, there are some decks that can use Economic Warfare better than others. What if you try to set up a scoring window with economic warfare? Think of the ideal turn where you drop one or two economic warfares on the runner after they make a run, and then proceed to jam an agenda in an ice remote. It's gonna be pretty hard for them to counter that, right? Nope! Nope, 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 that's not happening. Economic warfare does drain the runner's credit pool, but there are so many ways in which runners can counter that. 
They can easily contest remotes nowadays without a single credit in their credit pool thanks to cards like Stimhack, the ideal card of choice for runners for contesting remotes. This is a pretty popular card played nowadays in the competitive scene and with good reason. It gives you the extra edge needed you know, to contest a remote one or two turns earlier than you normally could have with an extra 9 credits. Huge number of money, a uh, huge amount of money I should say. So this is something that economic warfare cannot uh, circumvent. And because of that, I would not rely on building on, uh, I would not build a deck that relies on economic warfare, uh, keeping the runner out due to them being too poor to contest the remote. That is the stuff of dreams. Most of the time, you probably won't be able to pull off an economic warfare scoring window. Now, what other synergies are there with economic warfare? Well, we can profit from war by leveraging on cards that abuse your credit differential with the runner. Traces like hard hitting news come to mind where you can punish the runner for suddenly being too poor. Or you could play cards that require the runner to be below a certain credit threshold. And that's what we are going to be trying today. We are going to be looking to play economic warfare with Brian Stinson. Why Brian Stinson, you might ask? Well, just look at his face. Wouldn't you play with him? Ugh, douchebag. So, this is the list we're gonna play in, and yes, it's not gonna be in Wayland because Wayland is crap. Nah, just kidding. We are playing it in uh, HB because the, uh, ultraviolet clearances are very expensive. For influence a pop, I think I'd rather do the, inver the converse by importing Economic Warfare and Brian Stinson uh, into HB instead. Because at the end of the day, HB has the better eyes, better agendas, yada yada yada. So, the, if you look closely, this is actually pretty similar to Wilfie's uh, World's Winning CI deck. Uh, basically, it has the same synergy, except that instead of making the runner poor with reverse accounts into uh, Brian Stinson, we are using Economic Warfare into Brian Stinson instead. And we are also using the shinier cards, uh, cards that are re relatively new, like a NGO Front, Ginger City Grid, and you will also notice that our good friend Violet Level Clearance is missing. That's right, this is post uh, Most Wanted List 2.1, so we don't have the luxury of playing Violet Level Clearance. This is actually a big hit to this deck. I actually had uh, this deck with Violet Level initially before the Most Wanted List was released, and just as I was about to play it, the news came out, and suddenly I can't publish a video on it because it'll be outdated immediately. So we'll have to make do with this subpar deck because we can't play Brian Stinson off into VLC. Boo hoo. Well, uh, still not the end of the world. We'll try our best and see what we can make do with this. Today we are up against Mo Rodum, who is going to mow through our Ginger Grid servers with ease. Oh man, those stealth breakers so OP. Anyway, we'll see what we can make do with this. I'm going to, you know, pensively keep my opening hand here because it has some really nice cards. Yep, that's right, I'm looking at you, Ginger Grid and Ultraviolet Clearance. One very interesting play I could make this first turn would be to install Ginger Grid, um, install, say, the Adaptive Barrier on it, and then play Hedge Fund. This way, I'll have enough money to play the Ultraviolet next turn into the Ginger Grid if my opponent does not contest the ginger grid. That seems like a very solid game plan, so I went for it. Even though my centrals are exposed, what can smoke do? Yeah, she can indexing. That's pretty nasty. But thankfully my opponent uh, my opponent doesn't open with that. So I get to res the ginger grid here and draw into scarcity of resources. So I do a double take there because dropping a scarcity right now when smoke has no resources installed is a really great idea. But I really wanted to get the ginger grid going, so off to the uh, Ultraviolet I go, and I'm going to get uh, two ice. The Seda Adaptive Barrier obviously goes on my remote, where it will be the most effective due to all the ice being stacked on it, but I saved the Fairchild 3 for R&D. I cannot run the risk of not protecting R&D for too long, so the Fairchild 3 goes there. So sometimes you need to know when to hold your ice and when to um, you know, drop them on the table with Ginger Grid. Alright, my opponent sets up Sacrificial Construct which kind of hints to me that they might be running Tapworm. So I could play a Scarcity here, and that I do. I'm going to install the Vitruvius here, play the Scarcity and take a credit, uh, being prepared to play Ultraviolet next turn, or perhaps score the Vitruvius in the remote. Getting the Scarcity down is very important here because it stuns my opponent's growth in credits and cards, 
As long as I slow my opponent down, I should be able to score out before they get completely set up with infinite stealth credits. So they run HQ here to get a uh, su successful central run so that they can fulfill that tap worm trigger. And as I suspected, that was the restricted card. So no film critics, no employee strikes I have to worry about. But they have a very formidable economy engine here. If on my next turn I play the ultraviolet, I'll go up to 16 credits, giving them a very powerful uh, econ engine in the tap worm. So um, I'm kind of forced to purge the sacrif uh, sacrificial construct and tap worms here. Very annoying, but you have to do what you have to do. Tap Worm is very powerful against CI. As, as you see here, I draw into more money. So, kind of a no-brainer, even though this sets me back a whole big, uh, a whole chunk. You know, there's not much I can do about it. Right, so the bright side is the scarcity is also slowing down my opponent a whole chunk. To install the net marker you just saw there, my opponent paid the price. Five credits. Ouch. Not really worth it, but they had to do it because otherwise they won't be able to start chalking up the stealth credits they need. That is a win condition for them because if they don't have enough stealth credits, if they don't have the net marker, they can, they completely are unable to contest my ginger remote. So as you, as you know, as I'm drawing more cards, as I'm filling my hand, I'll be drawing to ice which goes on the ginger remote. So it's only going to get nastier from here on out and there's no way my opponent can contest the remote because they don't have breakers installed and they don't have the money to break double seder barrier. So uh, my Vitruvius is very safe in the remote, but uh, my opponent is buying themselves valuable time as um, I'm forced to purge the type worm. Unfortunately, it seems like they're out of options as they sheepishly install a sacrificial construct here, costing them two credits. I'm very happy to see that. I'll just continue purging. I draw into a fair shot three here and I choose not to install it with the ginger grid. Reason being, I think I might need to save at least one piece of ice for HQ. After playing an ultraviolet clearance, there is a very good chance that I'll be flooded with agendas, especially consider considering that I've drawn through a whole chunk of my deck, at least a quarter of my deck, and only seen one of my nine agendas. So you bet that there are lots of agendas coming up and I need to be able to show up HQ at a moment's notice. My opponent installs the right big breaker in the paperclip, that will allow them to get through my remote, but they're still dirt poor. I continue with my plan to purge the tap worm from my opponent's board as they continue setting up their rig. They are not too rich right now, they're not getting that many credits on Netmerker, and they're only on one credit. This is where having Brian Stinson would really propel me forward. Alas, that is not to be. I do not have Stinson with me right now, I'm not able to trigger him. And even if I did, I'm probably better off getting rid of my opponent's tap worm, which is making them a lot of money. So they continue chalking up credits on Net Mercur and continue installing a bunch of stuff. And at the end of their turn, you'll notice that they install a sap, uh, tap, another tap one with a site, which I purge. But one thing that I could have done here, um, apparently I clarified this uh, ruling, is that you can play Economic Warfare here. My opponent made a run last turn to install the tap one. I could play ta uh, Economic Warfare to force my opponent to lose the two credits on Net Mercur. That would have been an interesting decision. I chose not to because I was so laser focused on getting rid of the tap worm, but in that situation, getting rid of my opponent's hard earned stealth credits on Netmerker could have been a very interesting play. The reason that is uh, allowed is because Netmerker can be used for anything. Uh, that includes paying for Economic Warfare's credit loss. And uh, Economic Warfare says you must do it if able. So I'm, if my opponent has two credits in their credit pool and two on Netmerker, as my opponent did just now, uh, I would be able to take all those credits with Economic Warfare and really put a hurt in my opponent's credit pool. So I settled on a not so good Economic Warfare here. I drained four credits from their main credit pool, but I wasn't able to hit their net worker credit pool. Still, it's uh, very beneficial for me. I'm coming out ahead here as they're forced to click for credits next turn. On zero credits, they really can't do anything. They can't afford to run centrals even because they won't have money to pop the SMC for stuff. So you see there, my single click uh, to play the economic warfare resulted in my opponent being forced to spend four clicks to gain four credits. I'd say that's a huge win for me. That's an entire turn lost by my opponent just by me playing the economic warfare. Uh, now they are in the same position they were last turn, but they've lost an entire turn to me, a turn which I happily spent advancing my Vitruvius. So the power of economic warfare shining through right there. 
uh, which is quite surprising because you hardly get this sort of situations. You really only get synergies with Brian Stinson at most. It's quite hard to find a runner that's on four credits and has no economy resources on the table, but that's exactly where my opponent landed up last turn. So you notice here they took the fifth credit before playing the sure gamble. And an interesting thing to note here is that my opponent could have at an earlier point played the sure gamble using net Merker credits, but they chose not to which I found rather interesting. If I were them, I would have used the net marker credits to play for gamble, uh, play the gamble rather than waste clicks clicking for credits because that is super inefficient. So they finally assert some pressure on R&D and I show them the fetch out three, which cost them a fair amount to break. And they get to see one card off R&D. I was actually quite worried about this access. Uh, I still have eight agendas in my deck and I've drawn absolutely none of them. So I was highly expecting an agenda snipe there, but nope, it wasn't the case. Alright, we draw into Fairchild 2 here, which I don't install with Ginger Grid once again. Once again, I needed to shot R&D here because it seemed like my opponent was hinting at a future indexing. Which will explain why they were poking around for a single access on R&D. They have an indexing in hand, they are ready to play it next turn, I need to shot R&D. So prioritizing my centrals over my remote there, not that I have anything to jam in my remote just yet. I could play the NGO here, but there's a better thing to do. Play the Ultraviolet, draw into more cards. I now start seeing my agendas. There's an elective upgrade and a fetch out 3, which immediately goes on my remote. Now, for the Ultraviolet install, I chose the MC Austerity Policy. That card that grinds things out. Just like Wilfie's CI deck, this is a huge win condition that I'm going to play towards. And having got, uh, gotten rid of my opponent's sac con, at least um, two of my opponent's sacrificial constructs, I think. Um, I feel pretty good about uh, using MC Austerity to fast advance. Even if my opponent has clot, I can easily get rid of that from the table. So now I start draining my opponent's clicks. If <laughs> As if it, draining credits isn't enough, I'm going to drain clicks as well. While I'm gaining massive amounts of money, my opponent is now forced to contend with only 3 clicks to their turn. A lot less things they can do, their options are restricted, and that remote looks super untantalizing right now, especially given that they haven't found their dagger just yet. They can only play a couple of dirty laundries as I continue edging my way towards victory. Here I'm just deciding what to do with my remaining two clicks. I first click draw into another economic warfare, but that doesn't seem very relevant now that my opponent's so rich. I'm going to draw again to see a successful field test before advancing DMC Austerity for a second time. Uh, not so much advancing as playing a, placing a power counter on it. Anyway, now over to my opponent's side of the board. They play a diesel and now play the clot from hand. That's something I need to get rid of. So I think it's an obvious instant purge here. If I don't purge it now, uh, my opponent could potentially draw into a sacrificial construct next turn and make life harder for me. So into the bin it goes. I want to have nothing to do with that silly clot. Turn over to my opponent. Uh, they need to find a way to keep me from scoring my MCA. I'm kind of worried about legwork here, but instead they show the R&D pressure card in indexing. They go for it, they are rich enough, they have more than enough stealth credits, they are definitely going to get this off. The question is, how many agendas off the top? One or two? Well, we are about to find out. As they perform the indexing, I'm actually now pretty happy that I've drawn a whole bunch of agendas. There were once 8 agendas in my deck not too long ago, now there are only 4. I've drawn half of my agendas since then, uh, including the very key elective upgrade. And this is kind of why CI is a very powerful ID. Because it's very difficult for your opponent to snipe a key agenda like the elective upgrade from your hand. So this way, it, um, it basically guarantees that you're able to score the elective upgrade using MC Austerity Policy, even if your opponent locks you with indexing. Which my opponent does here, they mad dash R&D and do manage to find my other elective upgrade. If not for my expe extended hand size, it might be much easier for my opponent to snag the 5-3 from my hand, but I'm feeling pretty safe right now. I just have to worry that if that now that they're on 4 points, if they snag the 1 elective upgrade from my hand, they instantly win the game. Again, the benefit of playing CI is that it's very difficult for my opponent to do that. I have so many cards in hand, it's very difficult for them to fetch it. I'm The one card I'm worrying about here is legwork. That card could instantly lose me the game. They just have to hit 2 of my agendas or the single elective upgrade. I'm not very uh, thrilled about that. So I'm going to use Brian Stinson to double up as a Christian fake. My opponent doesn't really know my deck, so hopefully this will deter them from launching a blind leg work into my HQ. Hopefully buy a bit of time 
as they are on only two real credits and two stealth credits, it's going to be very difficult for them to afford a legwork at this point in time. So I'm just going to try my best to get this uh, elective upgrade scored quickly because once that's out of the way, I'm on match point and I can easily win with either of the Vitruviuses in my hand uh, one turn later. So my opponent needs to find a way to stop this remote. They surely can't. They don't have enough stealth... I mean, they might have enough stealth credits, but they don't have enough real credits. They would need a stim hack here with only three clicks to spare, meaning that any Fairchild 3s on my remote will potentially snag them. This is going to be a very challenging run for them, and I think they are not prepared to make the leap. So instead, they're going to uh, come up with some crazy hijinks. Uh, one that I was definitely not accounting for when uh, planning out my game plan. As you see here, more Rotom used Recycle to get Claude back into play. I didn't even know he got access to that move. Well, Scavenge is a very powerful card and you usually would use it to recover a Lost Breaker, but here my opponent clearly shows they know their ways about the game. Using Scavenge doubling up as a means of clot recursion, forcing me to spend yet another 3 clicks purging. I've had more than enough, more than enough of this purging business. Uh, but now my opponent starts attacking my hand, and this is where things start sliding downhill. Not only do they discover the bluff of Christian Grey on HQ, but they get one of my valuable agendas. Ah, that puts them on match point. Things become a lot harder from here. Even though they're poor, they don't have enough stealth credits to contest their re my remote, nor do they have uh, many credits to run HQ or R&D. Their win is very near. And I'm still very far away from my victory, so this is looking pretty dicey. I need, uh, after my opponent took their turn here, drew a bunch of cards, I needed to take some time to think of my next best move. Why don't you help me think of my next best move? Given the board state, what would you do here? MC austerity policy into elective upgrade seems like the best move, but is there a better move? Think about it, pause the video if need be. I'll be back shortly with uh, what I chose to go for. Alright, so as you notice, I mandatorily drew into a Brian Stinson. So immediately through my mind, I started thinking of all the possible ways I could leverage on Brian Stinson to win me the game. I still have a lot of cards in R&D and I have two Ultraviolets in my bin. So a possible move would be install Brian. Brian? Oh, sorry. Uh, there's already a Brian on HQ. You know that. So I could just flip the Brian Stinson and play two Ultraviolet clearances. That would give me a whole bunch of money, it would draw me 8 cards from my deck, and it would allow me to install 2 different cards from my hand. It could be the Ash that protects my centrals, it could be a Chrisium Grid that I draw, that protects R&D from indexing as well. That is a mighty swell solution. My biggest worry with doing that play is that my opponent can simply just keep hitting my hand every single time from now on, and I don't really have any recourse to that. Um, they can definitely click for credit, click for credit, click for credit, run HQ every time, and they are favoured here. Which is why I eventually decided to go with the elective upgrade play. Force them to make a big move on this final turn, or go bust. So the biggest thing I was worried about actually coming from my opponent's end is a legwork. After counting the influence in their bin, I realised that I think 3 influence spare, and given that they were frantically drawing through the deck with the diesel on the last turn, I suspected they were running a legwork in their deck. So even if I drew up big time with Brian Stinson and Ultraviolet Clearance, I would only be prolonging the game and giving them a uh, legwork, which would probably win them the game anyway. So given that the legwork was Im uh, imminent, uh, I decided to just quickly close out the game and get rid of the elective upgrade from my hand. This increases the odds of me surviving a legwork here. So, it, I mean, legwork is pretty trivial. Even though it's a fair shot 3 on HQ, they can easily drop a legwork and click through the HQ ice, or simply click for 3 credits and legwork. Both will work. They have cloak and smoke credits by now, so getting through HQ is a breeze. Uh, this is another reason why I want to score out so quickly, because the two recurring stealth credits from their ID and their cloak add up very quickly. I don't want to allow them to get the time to maximize all these recurring credits, so definitely threatening the win here, and my opponent is pondering very hard on the next move. Why don't you help them out? Think of what they need to do here. Now, um, let's make some assumptions here. Assume my opponent does not have access to legwork for some reason. Further, assume that they do not have an indexing in hand. There is an indexing somewhere in the three cards remaining in the stack, but they can't guarantee drawing into it. Those are the only relevant cards here. 
But note that they do have the same old thing installed which allows recursion of certain cards. You can look at the bin. Uh, I think I looked through it a couple of times. So uh, given this information, what is the ideal play for my opponent? Pause the video if need be. We'll be revealing my opponent's play shortly. So my solution is as such. Given that my opponent could retrieve either indexing or scavenge with the same old thing, I would have click 1 draw, click 2 draw. If either of them were indexings, I would go for the indexing. Otherwise, I would use same old thing on scavenge instead to buy me one more turn to uh, of course scavenging for clot buying me one more turn to find my indexing as the last card on on my stack and then go in next turn now my opponent instead uses the same old thing on indexing directly because they wanted to guarantee the indexing uh, the problem with my suggested play was that i could easily continue icing up r d especially with the help of brian stinson and that way, my opponent would not be able to get through R&D anymore with the indexing. So I think my opponent made the right play here by going straight for the same old indexing and it paid off. Even though I haven't completely drawn through the R&D indexing lock from last time, and even though there were only three agendas remaining on R&D, my opponent fetches the win with the sales team. Despite Morotom's ability to leave Storm his way through my centrals, I, it was, I still managed to make it a close game, and I was pretty satisfied with that. Um, the, in particular, the last few turns led to some really interesting decisions, and I hope you enjoyed playing along with it. Uh, my decision to not fire Stinson may have been a wrong one, but it was grounded in a lot uh, of good reasoning, uh, lines of reasoning, some of which I didn't explain during the video. Um, <clears throat> at the point when my opponent played the final indexing for the win, uh, four of the five cards they would access are fresh cards. The top card was from the previous indexing. So if I played uh, Ultraviolet with Stinson, I would have given my opponent five fresh cards if they managed to indexing their way through. Uh, the other thing about Stinson UVC is that even though it seems like a huge swing, and it is, ma uh, make no mistake, a single click for 10 credits and four cards is utterly insane. The problem is, at that stage in the game, I did not need the credits nor the cards to win the game. If I was able to, you know, install a bunch of cards, install a bunch of ice on centrals to prevent further runs, I would have considered that. But UVC doesn't allow you to install that many cards, and most of the cards I would install are not very good against smoke. Ice just doesn't stand much of a chance against smoke, and I was basically drawing into my one outer in Christian Grid. If I didn't hit it, I basically would have no chance of winning the game. So this is why I decided to go for the quick, fast advance instead um, and get my 3-pointer out of the way, which seemed like a reasonable option. At the end of the day, even though I lost the game, I definitely did not feel upset about it at all because I actually stood a very good chance of winning that game. Um, I, yeah, My opponent basically hit the single HQ access they got uh, in the mid to late game, uh, the one where they stole the Vitruvius. That was a 40% chance to hit. Uh, if they got the 60% instead, uh, there would be almost no way my opponent wins on the final turn. They would have to go for some Hail Mary, double HQ run, all that sort of thing, because they wouldn't be on match point. Being on match point makes it easier for my opponent to win, but they still had to go through uh, the indexing trial, where they had a non-negligible chance, a 36% chance of whiffing off the indexing uh, as well. So all in all, again, I can't be too upset about how I played this game. Uh, the odds just didn't work in my favor this time, but it was a very close finish. Uh, what about economic warfare? I'm, the other reason I'm so satisfied with the game was because I got to showcase the sheer power of economic warfare. Even though um, I did not get to play them in the early game as I would have liked, they still make a, made a huge impact. Uh, against my opponent, who was forced to click for th credits throughout the entire game. On turn 8 even, I was able to subdue my opponent into spending the entire turn to clicking up for credits. It's kind of like closing your opponent, uh, your tag me opponent's accounts after uh, they, and forcing them to click for 4 credits on the next turn. It feels so good, and Economic Warfare allows you to do that uh, with a lot less of that conditional, you know, you don't need to tag your opponent. Just wait for them to make a run, and boom, they're now poor. Uh, one thing I didn't mention in the video is that I actually played the second economic warfare I drew. That was very late in turn 15. They were on roughly 6 credits at that point. That economic warfare put them down to 2 credits in the credit pool, which made the final turn decision that much harder. If my opponent had more credits on their final turn, 
uh, I think it would have been a rather straightforward play to say more indexing and if that with they would be able to make a couple more runs on HQ because they would have the credits to break through Fairchild 2 multiple times. Uh, without that line of play available because they were so poor, it was a completely different story. So again, economic warfare coming into play here, uh, actually preventing my opponent from, make, from making as many central runs as they would have liked and completely shutting, uh, discouraging them from running the remote server at all. Uh, throughout the entire game, I was worried about threats that never actually hit. Uh, Stim hack on remote was a good one, which was why I was dedicating lots of ice to the remote. In retrospect, perhaps fewer ice would have done it. Padding my hand with more non-agendas could have helped me, as well as the all-time dreaded leg work. I'm pretty sure they ran it somehow. Some reason it just didn't come out. I was playing around that so hard, uh, but it never made it anyway. All good. Uh, didn't have to worry about losing agendas from HQ. In the end of at the end of the day, very close game and great game to Rotom Appliance. Always fun to play games against him. And in the meantime, as always, thanks for watching and happy net running. Peace.